This podcast is brought to you by Bernie's Tap and Grill. It's family owned and operated since 1954, located across from Wrigley Field on Clark and Waveland. My dad hit a few home runs on the Waveland Avenue, and Bernie's was my dad's favorite place to go. It's got delicious food, four full service bars, an awesome beer garden, a sidewalk patio cafe, and a cool upstairs area. It's the place I've always met my friends at before and after games. Go on by and tell Linda Dillman, Jeff Santos sent you. Bernie's Tap and Grill, where you go when you go to Wrigley. Sit back and relax. It's time for Peanuts, Popcorn, and Cracker Jacks. Hey, how's it going? I'm your host, Jeff Santo. I'm here with my wife, Christy. We have another great special guest interview that you're going to really enjoy listening to. We dive deep into an art form that sings like a song where one slip up can make it all go wrong. But this guy's a pro, and he's been perfecting his art form for 40 consecutive years. And our Cracker Jack surprise to close it out had a unique ride during the Cubs' 1969 pennant race season. You can say she had an up-close and personal seat at the Santo table. I guess you could say it like that. Oh, yeah. I had a different opening of this show before I got some very sad news from Wrigleyville. Very sad news. Beth Murphy from Murphy's Bleachers passed away. I was stunned. I still can't believe it. Right? On our last episode, I just talked about hearing from Beth after our opening episode. I had no idea she was that ill. She mentioned none of that to me in our Facebook exchange. I knew she was dealing with cancer, but I heard she got past a difficult point a few months ago, so I figured she was on the good side of it. I've noticed over a lifetime that the ones who give so much to the world's When they know the end is near, they don't make a big thing of it. They actually do the opposite. They're givers. They gave their all in their lives. And they let the curtain close without a curtain call. And I think that is because they don't want to see and hear the sadness for themselves. Because they lived their lives happy. They didn't live in sadness. They want to remember the joy and they actually retreat into it. I really believe the special ones leave us like that. They depart from us with the joy of their journey. Life is joy in the muck of it all. So let's celebrate the joy of Beth Murphy's life. Yes. How about that view she had at Wrigley every day? Oh, the best. The back of the scoreboard felt like it was part of her property. I could throw a baseball from her beer garden, probably reach second base on a roll. Oh, sure you could. I could. I said a roll in my younger days. (laughs) Just showing up to work every day and seeing that magnificent ballpark, all the history that lives in it, all the wonderful moments and celebrations, and to have that as your view for over half a century, come on. Right. The who's who of Chicago and beyond who have passed through her doors is legendary. Oh, yeah. Like when we went to Game 5 of the World Series after they won, when we went to the back room of hers after going to Bernie's, it was like going to a speakeasy. There's so many people there. Right. I think the first thing I saw was Eddie Vedder and Chris Chelios crowd surfing. <laughs> then there was Bill Murray and Bonnie Hunt. Oh, yeah. And even that St. Louis Cardinal fan, John Ham, was in there. Oh, Ham. Ham was hamming it up. <laughs> and Beth was in the middle of all that fun, and her smile is etched in my brain. And remember when Pearl Jam played on a rooftop in 2016? Oh, that was epic. Oh, uh, what a moment. I mean, everyone outside surrounding Murphy's bleachers, it was like a Beatles moment. Yeah. Eddie Vedder was a dear friend of Beth's. And I'm sure many of you have seen him walk through, the, through her doors more than a few times during a Cubs season. He's heartbroken over Beth. To everyone at Murphy's Bleachers, Freddie and the staff, our hearts are with you all. And I know you will be celebrating her life through the season, and I hope it's a magical one for Beth. So long, Beth Murphy. Rest in joy. We'll miss you. Gino's East of Chicago, doing deep dish in Chicago since 1966, now has an L.A. location. Same great recipes, same great ingredients. That's no joke. Their deep dish tastes exactly the same as it does in Chicago. It's my favorite. I love the deep dish. And Gino's East is where I go when I want a taste from home. Named best pizza in L.A. by L.A. Times readers, and I certainly agree. Plus, there's a full menu of Italian favorites. Chicago tavern-style pizza and the Italian beef sandwich. Dine in for great food straight from the oven. Or do carry-out or delivery. For great pizza and great atmosphere, go to 12924 Riverside Drive in Sherman Oaks, near the corner of Riverside and Coldwater Canyon, 
just off the 101 in the Coldwater Canyon exit. Or order online. Go to GenosEast.com. My guest today is in his 40th consecutive year as a play-by-play broadcaster for Major League Baseball. He's called eight no-hitters. He's in the WGN Radio Walk of Fame. Only a third broadcaster to do so. Voted into the Cubs Hall of Fame last year. And this year, he reached the top of his craft. You know it's him when you hear him. He just won the Ford Frick Award. He's going into baseball's Hall of Fame. He's a consummate pro and a great guy. He used to always introduce my dad as Cubs legend Ron Santa. Well, now I get to do that to him. I'm so honored and proud to be here with Cubs legend Pat Hughes. Hey, Pat, thanks for being on my show, man. Well, Jeff, that was a wonderful open right there, and that that brought back an immediate memory of your father because when I got the job back in 19, it was actually the autumn of 1995, um, I met your dad, and I knew him a little bit, but then I got to know him better and better, and then I got the job, and then it just seemed like he was a, a legendary figure in Chicago long before I got there, so it was a natural thing for me to introduce him as Cubs legend Ron Sato. And um, to this day, there are still people that say they miss the two of us together. Yeah, man, you guys were great. I I really believe, like, when you got there and you guys became a booth of two, because my dad had three before, and it's just like you guys clicked. There was there was just something so special about it. Like, you were the guy that always stayed, stayed on cue, and my dad went all different ways, right? But you seem to just play with it, man, and you let him be himself in the booth. And and, and I know that that he was so grateful for that, Pat. Well, we we were a team, Jeff. We were, and uh, we were very different people. Um, But I think sometimes the differences are what create a great partnership. Uh, You don't want the same exact personality uh, in a radio team. Uh, you don't want two guys that have the exact same personality. I think it meshes very well uh, when guys are different. For example, Harry Carey and Steve Stone, they were a very popular team, and they were extremely right. different people as well. So I think we we kind of just learned uh, that what we had was really working, and it became a very popular broadcast. The ratings were great. The sales were great. Uh, everyone seemed to like it. And I think, Jeff, really, whenever you're in any form of entertainment where it's popular, you don't really question it. You just keep riding that wave as long as you possibly can. And that's simply what I did. Exactly, man. I got to say, my first first thing I got to ask you here is something I never got a chance to ask my dad. What's it feel like to be going in the Baseball's Hall of Fame? Well, it feels wonderful. Let me answer that directly to you right away. And let me say this about your dad. It is just a darn shame that he was not allowed in the Hall of Fame while he was still alive. And I can actually feel myself getting emotional saying that because I I know what it meant to him, what what it means to everybody, everybody who has devoted their life to a particular thing like baseball. And, and Ronnie, like I said earlier, Jeff, was a, a he was an iconic figure in Chicago long before I got to town, uh, having broken into the big leagues way back in 1960. And then he was he was one of the best players in baseball for the next 14 or 15 years. So um, it's just a shame, though, and I'm not sure exactly why he was not allowed in the Hall of Fame uh, before he passed, but that's what fate dictated. And I've often said that had Ronnie appeared at Cooperstown, I think they would have had record attendance figures for his induction. Uh, I think Cal Ripken Jr. set the all-time record when when he went into the Hall of Fame. But I, in respect to Cal, I would say that the crowds would have been even bigger had your father gone into the Hall of Fame while he was still alive. Yeah, thank you for that, Pat. You know, it's it's weird. Like, when, when the Cubs won the World Series in 2016, you know, I thought a lot about, you know, his Cubs journey. You know, uh, never seen a Cubs World Series or the Hall. And I'm sure you thought about that, too, a lot. Um, and it almost feels to me 
and I don't know about you, but like that was his story, though. You know what I mean? He his story wasn't about getting the ring or or walking into the hall. It was that battle, his his battle throughout. You know how far he came from where he began, and I think I think that fits him. I, and I almost think that you know at the end he was okay with it all. You know what I mean? There was something there that I could I could actually say he was okay with it all. I, I know it was a he was bitten by hard luck, but don't you think that that was who he was? That's that's a great uh, insight, and that's a complicated question, and it's probably uh, something you could answer and and uh, kind of attack it from many different angles. But um, Jeff, when the Cubs did win the World Series, uh, it was just enormously exciting for everyone who was a ball player and a fan and a broadcaster. But then I had the assignment at Grant Park during the rally after the parade, which was incredible. Uh, it, it, there were millions of people. Literally, the whole city shut down for that Friday afternoon. And everyone, it seemed like, was at the Cubs rally uh, and, and uh, at the parade. But when I got up to speak, it was my job to introduce all of the ball players at the rally. And over at Grant Park, I remember looking out at this ocean of humanity, and I, I was asking one of the stagehands there, one of the engineers who uh, was in charge of the audio equipment, and I said, about how many people do you think are here today? And he looks out and he said, well, we had a concert here a few years ago and they had 500,000, but there's at least twice as many people here today. Huh? Wow. There's a million people. Wow. Uh, wow. But I think it, I think they estimated it at 900,000 people. And here I am. I'm going to get out. I'm just a radio <laughs> guy. You know? And I'm going to go out and I'm going to talk to 900,000. But then I thought, <laughs> wait a minute. It's no time to be nervous. This is one of the great events in the history of the Chicago Cubs. The fans just want to have fun. The players want to have fun. So I did not get nervous. And what I don't know if you remember it or if you watched it or had any oh, access yeah. to the video at all. But I said, before I begin, there are four people that I am thinking about that are no longer with us. And I know they would have absolutely loved to be here celebrating the Chicago Cubs World Series. I said, two of them are broadcasters and two of them are players. I said, Jack Brickhouse and Harry Carey, Ron Santo and Ernie Banks. And I, yep. after each one, uh, they gave an enormous cheer, as I knew they would, but it seemed appropriate thinking how important those four guys were to the history of the Chicago Cubs and the popularity and what it meant uh, to them to be part of the Cubs. And it just didn't seem right that the four of them could not have been there. Can you imagine your dad watching the World Series and then celebrating it. How about Ernie? Jeff, you knew Ernie very well. He would right. have been completely out of control with joy. And the same yes. thing with Harry and Jack Brickhouse. And, and again, I'm, I'm actually uh, kind of getting emotional just thinking about it. But uh, I'm glad I did that because um, yeah. it seemed appropriate, seemed the right thing to do. And, and um, of all the things that I've done, I'm very happy that I did that. Oh, that, that's awesome, Pat, and thank you for that, man. And, you know, it was so nice to see all the jerseys, the 10s and the 14s, you know, during the World Series. And, you know, I, I just think that the fans, you know, had those guys in, in, in their hearts. And, you know, that was special to the family, you know, just to see all that. And you're right. It's like you don't know what my dad would have done, right? We're like, oh, my. And maybe that's the reason. It's like, well, we don't know. And it's let people think what he would do, you know. Um, but uh, it just wasn't in the cards, you know, and, and, and his life was kind of that hard road. You know, he always had the odds against him and, and he still battled through everything. And so, you know, I'm just like I said, our family was just so honored and moved by all the jerseys and how what everyone was saying. And so, you know, we got to be his witness for both the World Series and the Hall of Fame and everyone who cared about him were the witness, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. that's how I kind of take it. And, you know, I'm getting, you know, this Hall of Fame thing, Pat, is so big. Um, and I just, I just feel like, you know, you're going into the hall this summer 
I, I really want to know what, what, like, your psychological play-by-play, where did your thoughts go on that? Well, um, it's a great question. And, again, that's something I could probably spend two or three hours answering, but I, I won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, part of the issue uh, that I'm having right now, and I'm trying to write the speech, and certainly I'm going to remember – and acknowledge your father as one of the most significant people in my life, um, right in there with, you know, my parents and my older brother, John, all, all of them have passed, and um, I wish they could be here. But they've limited the speech, Jeff, to, uh, they said, try to keep it between 10 and 12 minutes. Now, if, if it goes 20 minutes, I think they'd be okay. Bob Costas, bless his heart one of the most talented people ever in our business. I think he spoke for an hour and 17 minutes in his <laughs> induction about four years ago. So uh, maybe he didn't get that memo about the 10 to 12 minute thing. I don't know, <laughs> but I, I, can't, I can't go on and on and on. It's not my style to just play hit and run and just mention people's names and go on. So it's gonna no. be a real challenge for me to try to acknowledge as many people as I can and talk about what it means to me personally. I don't, I don't know if I can achieve all of this, to be honest with you, but um, uh, you know, that that's, th those are kind of some of the thoughts I have. I've got people that uh, you know, people that influence me as broadcasters uh, playing sports as a kid, following the giants, Willie Mays and Willie McCovey and Orlando Cepeda. And, um, you know, the people that I got to listen to, broadcasters that I listened to, and then playing college basketball and starting. Now, here, here's a story. I don't know if you knew this, but I was already taking broadcasting classes in college. I knew my athletic career, which was a very modest career compared to people like your father. But it was coming to an end. But I loved it. I loved playing. I was sitting were you on playing the bench baseball like, and were you playing baseball and uh, basketball? Yeah, I got to play high school in both, uh, started on varsity. I played in a Colt League uh, all-star team that played in the Colt League World Series. I played on championship teams in Little League, Pony League, um, uh, college, and then, and, you know, in high school, I played on some very good teams. And then I played one year of college basketball. But again, my career was going to end, and I knew it. I'm sitting on the bench. All of a sudden, during one of our games, I start doing the play-by-play -play of the game involving my team for my teammates on the bench. <laughs> and they kind of start chuckling a little bit. And then I stopped. I thought, I don't want to be annoying about this. And we're, we're sitting way down at the end of the bench so the coaches can't hear it, of course. And um, I stopped. And then one of my teammates said, hey, Pat, you know, you're not that bad. Keep going. So I did. So I, I, I guess you could say, Jeff, that my first live audience of my play-by-play -play consisted of the other bench warmers on my college team. So <laughs> that was wow. the uh, that was the beginning. That was the beginning, kind of inglorious, but uh, that's how it all started. And then I started taking classes. My older brother got me involved on doing football um, sideline reporting, and then I'm doing play-by-play. -play. And when I go all in on something, I'm like a, a borderline lunatic because I did every show, every interview, every chance I got to do play by play, I did it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how I got started. And I gradually got better at it. And then I was able to get some uh, jobs out of high out of uh, college. And, um, you know, from there, I just kind of kept on working. And, and now here it is. I'm, I'm a, Big league announcer for over 40 years. It's kind of amazing. It is amazing, Pat. I mean, the dedication, that's what it takes. That's why you're a Hall of Famer. It's that dedication. And, I, and my dad had the same dedication in baseball. It's like, it's like you figured it out. Like having someone kind of give you that push. Everyone needs a push and tells you that, okay, you did a good job there. But did you know, like when you were a kid, you had those broadcast pipes? Did you feel it early on, even before you did it? No. Uh, no. no. Uh, and when, when you're a kid, uh, like you probably, your dad was a big league ball player. I wanted to be a big league athlete. I wanted to be a, a football quarterback or a shooting guard in the NBA or a or a shortstop for the Giants. 
But I mean, you know, you have these dreams when you're a kid, and then later on they seem kind of uh, absurd and and unrealistic. But when you're a kid, you don't know how unrealistic they are. And and I realized when I was about 17 that that dream was not going to happen. I just didn't have the right. talent. I'm not embarrassed by that. Very few people have the talent to play at the professional level. It's a tiny, tiny percentage of people who go on to play even for one day at the big league level. And to do what, for example, your dad did, to be an all-star year in and year out for a decade is unbelievable. You're, that's an even tinier percentage. So um, I wanted to be a player. When that dream ended, a new dream began, and I thought I would give this this play-by-play idea a shot, knowing that only a very small percentage of those guys make it to the big league level. But I figured I'm not worried about competition. I love to compete. Uh, you know that from playing golf with me, uh, you know, right. in Arizona. <laughs> Right, right. Um, I, and, and it didn't bother me. And I figured I'm going to give it all I've got. If I fail, I'll simply do something else. But it worked out okay, and and I'm very very lucky and very happy that it did. God, you know, it, it, and it's that experience you had in sports too to say, okay, now I can't play the game, but I could I could broadcast the game. And you wind up broadcasting. You've done hockey, you've done football, and obviously baseball is your thing, but. You picked up on it. it. You had to pick up on it so quick to be there. Like three years after that, you're actually broadcasting, right? Like you went to, did you go to uh, San, Jose, San Jose State and got a degree in radio and TV journalism? Yes. And, and I minored in, um, uh, let's see, uh, radio, TV, and minored in journalism. But uh, another thing that was helpful, Jeff, for me was being an umpire. And a referee, that's how I put myself through college Wow! by officiating games. And that taught me the rules. It kind of uh, taught me, you know, just the way everything kind of works. And it, it improved my play-by-play. And then I would listen to guys like Bill King, the great radio man of the Warriors and Raiders. And he, he later worked for the Oakland A's. Russ Hodges and Lon Simmons were the Giants announcers. I could hear Vin Scully at night. On, right. on radio in Northern California. So I would listen to these guys. And then you, you never want to copy from anybody, but there's an old saying that if you copy from another person, it's called plagiarism. But if you borrow from a lot of different people, it's called research. And, and I think I probably did a lot of research, but I never wanted to sound like anybody else. I, I thought, nope, let's just, you know, be the best that I can be, and let the chips fall where they may. Oh, that, that's beautiful, man. I mean, and you did. You found your old st- your own style. How long did that take to to find that groove? Well, that that's another great question because I think it's an, it's an evolution. I think as you get older, certain things change about. And you've been a producer, Jeff, and I'm sure that the, you can relate to this. When you're first starting your first project, you try to do the best that you can, but then your next project, you have that experience of knowing how to put things together and how to develop things like continuity and how to emphasize certain things and low-key other things. And I think that's what play-by-play is about, too. It's an artistic endeavor, and you try to polish off as many of the good things that you have as possible. You try to eliminate the things where you're not strong, or you work at them to try to make them a little bit better. But it's it's really um, trial and error, experimentation. Uh, you, you try things, you come up with sayings, and you think, I kind of like that. Um, you develop a home run call. I, I didn't sit down one day and you know start making that call. It just kind of came naturally to extend the word chance, that ball's got a chance, gone. (laughs) The only reason I did that, Jeff, is because when you see a fly ball, you know it's well hit. You see the outfielder go back to the fence. Three things are going to happen. Is he going to catch it? Is it going to be over his head off the wall? Or is it going to be a home run? I don't know. So I'm actually buying a second or two by stretching out the word chance to see what happens and then go from there. That's that's just an example, but um, oh, it's a very different 
all things. I think um, people who think play-by-play is easy, the only people who would say it are people who have never done it. It is so easy to make mistakes. It's very humbling. And you're going to make mistakes every day. You try to keep them to a minimum. You try to have fun. Uh, I had fun with your dad. I have fun with my current partner, Ron Coomer, who I absolutely love. I've been pretty lucky with guys named Ron, I would say, working yeah, with Cubs yeah, Radio. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but that's, that's what it is. And, and it's not, it's not uh, rocket science, but, again, it's not nearly as easy as people think. No way, right? It, and you work so hard. I, I, I had a chance to, to watch you, you know, traveling with the Cubs during the documentary, This Old Cub. And, boy, man, you were so prepared. I mean, it's like people don't realize that you get to where you, you're you going by, by hard work, you know, and I saw that my, my dad did it, and, and, and I saw that in you, man, and I said, wow, I mean, you're ready every game, you know, and you have your routine, um, and even like you're talking about your call, how, how it just came out, like, it's almost like a lyric, like you're singing a lyric, like, you, you know, it, you just keep it going. And and do you have like those lyrics written down on certain things when you started and and now okay I I know where I'm heading I I kind of got a, a bunch of songs here as far as describing baseball. That is really an interesting question, and I'm going to share a story with you. When I was in college, I remember listening to uh, Al Michaels doing Giants radio, and then Vin Scully did Dodger radio, and many times. Um, I would have a beverage or two, and, and in college, you know, you'd have a beer or two. And, and I would listen to these guys, and I thought, it sounds like these guys are singing their play-by-play. There's, there's a lilting. There's inflection in their voice. They are emphasizing certain words. They are bringing it down. It's almost like they are singing their play-by-play. So really an interesting question by you. And wow. I, I um, uh, look at it like I'm a, a musician, but I would say that certainly there are certain similarities between doing play-by-play and singing. You're trying to hit the high notes. You don't want to have your voice crack. Now, here's something. Let me share this with you. During Game 7 of the World Series, I was so concerned about not getting too excited for the final out. I do not want my voice to crack on the final out of the World Series. So I kept saying, keep your voice down, keep your voice down. This play is going to be replayed for the next 100 years, maybe even longer than that. You want this to be a good call. You want your voice to be under control. Do not get too excited. So, I mean, those are just some some thoughts that come to mind when you bring up the lyrical quality of doing play-by-play, because it does exist. Again, I can't speak for other people, but it certainly exists for me. That moment was brought to you by Tangent West, executive recruiters, headquartered in Denver, with offices in Vail, Colorado, and New Orleans. Since 1995, Tangent West has conducted executive searches nationally and internationally. They place C-level executives, management positions, high-level executive assistants, marketing and accounting, and finance. Cheryl Grimaldi, president, has personally interviewed over 36,000 candidates and has filled over 2,500 searches. I've known Cheryl for decades. She's a dear family friend and someone you can trust. She's been at this for a long time. Tangent West, hunting human excellence and building the country's finest company since 1995. Because nothing matters more than hiring the right people. If you're hiring, go to www.tangentwest.com. Now it's time for the Cracker Jack call. I'm going to be calling my sister, Linda. Here we go. Cracker Jack. This call is being recorded. Hello? Hello, Linda. You are the Cracker Hi, Jack this week. I'm How the Cracker doing? Jack. Surprise. <laughs> All right. We're going to get right into it. Okay. We're getting uh, in the time machine, and we're going back. So going back. Okay. When 
when you were working in radio in Chicago and you would go to the Cub games, didn't Dad okay. spy on you from the booth when, when when you were sitting in those front row Linda Doman seats? <clears throat> what what was that? What, what was he worried about? I I, I don't know. I, I was spying, but yes, I think he was definitely keeping an eye on me. Maybe it was spying, but um, that actually started in high school. Um, Oh, no, that was after high school. You're right. You're right. It was after college when I went back. And then in radio, we would sit in Linda Dillman's front row. And I would um, it, and I would be with friends and be like, what is your dad doing? And we would look back and he would have binoculars on us. And um, and he would he would see me and I'd wave and then he'd wave back. And it was actually funny for multiple reasons, because he was uh, we were right behind the Cubs bullpen where the pitchers are. So front row. and. Uh, Sometimes it would just be my coworkers or we'd have clients and we would chit chat with them and they knew who I was. And uh, he was always concerned that um, I was flirting with the baseball players, um, which I was just having friendly conversation. But well, um, during we, the game, during the games, during the games. Well, I mean, like, oh, yeah, geez. well, maybe like right before the game started. And, you know, they'd be warming up and they'd stick down right there. I mean, they were right in front of us, like literally. Right, 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 right. And they would just chit chat. And, you know, it obviously after, because we were in those seats a lot. So, you know, after a period of time, I mean, I think they knew like that I would sit there and who I was. And um, then we would go up to the booth to visit dad to say hi. And he'd be like, what are you doing down there? I see you talking. Don't be talking to those players. I don't want people thinking my daughter's a groupie. That's what I would say. Yeah. And who yeah. who are some of the like yeah, those seats are right there in the bullpen. So yeah, they actually like they sit right in front of you. So who were some of the players you were talking with and that that dad had a problem with? Oh gosh. Um well Randy Myers, definitely. Oh um actually yeah. he and I He's actually a had one. a like <laughs> Yes. And he ended up like uh, we actually ended up being friends. Uh, you know, we we went out a couple times, but it wasn't anything like serious. But he would then mess with dad about it, so that would get to dad. But he was really funny too. Like he respected dad more than anything. But he got a kick out of it. So once he and I became friends, he kind of got the rest of those guys out there um, in on it. So really, it became more about messing with dad than exactly. really hitting on me. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so. But then there was that other pitcher. Who was the pitcher uh, who actually <laughs> did ask out my girlfriend and she went out with him? Um, who was the one that um, he, he had to jump over the line? He had some weird uh, – he was a pitcher. He had dark hair. Oh, he skipped – a lot of guys skipped over that line. I, yeah. I, no. God, he you're talking in like – Yeah. Well, we're, we're talking like – <laughs> 90s, right? We're talking 90s, right? Early 90s? We're talking early 90s. It would have to be yeah, like 93, 94, 95. Oh, my gosh. I can't remember his teams. name. Those were some tough teams. Uh, I know. Pitchers came, was, uh, came and went then. I know. So, uh, anyway. I, was I just he a remember starter he, or was he? No, he was a reliever. He was like a middle or, uh, yeah, reliever. And he, um, I just remember like, yeah, we'd hung out one point, all of us, and he had headshots for himself that he signed and gave it to my friend and then broke up with her. Oh, um, not here. Um, We're going to find out who it is eventually, but um, I, I think someone will hit dark hair. Did, oh my gosh, I should. I have to call her. Yes, so um, dad what, would. Dad what, would do that. What was? was and you said he had a binoc He had binoculars, right up there. He had binoculars. Yeah, I mean, obviously he knew I was going to the game that day, <laughs> and then right. he. And sometimes it was just a wave, just to catch and say hi. I see you. Um, you know, there were also there was you know a couple of stories where we would be there and I would be with friends who um, would somehow say who I was to the crowd around us to you know the other fans and they'd be like no way there's no way you're Ron Sano's daughter and my friends love to be like oh yeah she is just look wait he'll look he'll wave right now Linda turn around wave your dad because they'll have binoculars at a certain amount of time. And sure enough, the people around us would see me wave, and then he'd wave back, and they're like, "Oh my God, you are his daughter." Uh, great, great to have friends to to egg that on. Wow. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was. Know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make the fun. game comfortable. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm kidding. You guys were. Yeah, you were in Chicago uh, working at the uh, in radio, which is my next right? question for you. Yeah. Um, when Dad started in the booth, 
he was more nervous than I thought, but you knew he was. You you were going to school down in Loyola, I think, in the city. So you were around him a lot at that time. Tell tell us about right. like his leap into the booth. Well, I think with that one, you know, obviously you guys had the benefit of when Dad played, and so when the broadcast opportunity came up, um, I was actually able to see Dad like in that light of, and it it, it it took him to a whole new level, and it also kind of reignited his playing days. So I right. remember as a family, we were all involved in him taking that position. You know, I know he was so excited about it, but he was also vulnerable, right? He was nervous and anxious, and I remember we were yep. actually involved and talking him through that decision and and taking it and his you know his one insecurity is like okay he knows the game but you know he does he felt he wasn't as polished obviously as um clearly as like a play by play or even some of the other color, color, color commentators but um i just remember you know he would call after a few uh, first games because you know he was a little um conscious of what he was saying and mm-hmm. would be like did you hear me how do I sound? I didn't think I sounded good. You know, you know, he just was so, um, but you know, he was hard on himself, but that's what made him so good. And I know right. that, uh, especially when he was with, um, um, Tom Brenneman and Bob Brenly, um, the biggest joke was like having to hit the cough button. I remember him telling me, Oh, they had to hit the cough, the cough button three times, uh, today right. because he would, you know, maybe drop a swear word. And I know that right. that was, <laughs> they were trying to control the emotions. But yeah. by the time, you know, he moved on with uh, Pat, you know, he was just so settled. And I think Pat just, um, you know, I just think Pat just complimented him so well. And I think he felt so secure because then it was just like the two of them in the booth. Because I know he was, he was rotating for a while initially, right? With, right. Yeah. um those other guys and even Harry was Harry Carey Harry Carey came in for three yeah. innings so yeah and right. Tom went right. went to TV yeah so it was a switch around and then when um Pat came in I just inter- had a great interview with Pat so I mean you're talking oh. about what, yeah and it it really he did him and Pat just Pat Pat made him be comfortable up there to just be himself and not have to feel like he had to be some polished commentator which which everyone loved you know on on that level right. and you you knew if if the Cubs were uh Losing, you, you just turn on the radio and you could tell by Ted's tone, you know. So, but that that it's, worked and it was just great, great partnership. Yeah. Yeah, Pat Pat embraced um, that part, and then you know, obviously, it just became a show in itself. I mean, people were just tuning in, not necessarily because I think the baseball wasn't always so good, especially if it was right. a long season. And um, I think people just still wanted to hear what they had to say, which obviously, yeah. you know, like they would go off on tangents. And um, but I, I, I know that the time he was with Pat. Yeah, that was um, I, I mean, it was like he became I knew him famous as a broadcaster. You knew him as a player. Um, I mean, right. obviously, I knew he played, but I don't have those memories like you. And so right. I saw him in a completely different light as, you know, a young adult. And it was fun to be actually in the same business, so to speak, right, and, right. Um, you know, and be able to even take clients and be a part of that. It was always like such a special moment to be able to go um, to Wrigley. And, um, you know, that was definitely a perk um, that exactly. I brought into the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now we're going to shift directions on this. I'm going to go a little deep here on, uh, but oh. but in a, in a different kind of way. Mom was okay. pregnant. A lot of people don't know. Mom was pregnant with you during the whole 1969 season. Can you believe the ride you went on before you were even born? What a roller coaster for an unborn person. Um, I, I don't remember it, actually. No, I know. But if you think about it, if you just did like a, a subconscious breakdown on that one, I mean, literally, you were there the whole season in her belly <laughs> through like, I'm sure you heard great moments. And then all of a sudden, the darkness comes in September and um, wow. I mean, you don't know if that like, you know, <laughs> did you ever think about that? No, you know, it's funny you say that because I didn't all of my life growing up. I never put the two together. It really wasn't until, I mean, Jeff, I, I, I would say actually even after dad passed that I was really thinking about, you know, because obviously we had all these beautiful ceremonies, you know, celebrating his life and, 
the Hall of Fame, you know, then you start going, hey, you know, actually, I was a part of that. I was actually, oh, my gosh, mom was carrying me. I was that that big pivotal year that everyone talked about. I was actually really kind of part of I was you were. I was along for the ride. I just, you know, obviously in a different way. But, you know, I think we were talking about wait, was that the year two with the man on the moon? Did I get that oh, right? yeah, that's, uh, absolutely. Would, right. Yeah, and so I think mom was telling and, that story. Yeah. yeah. And um, but didn't dad did something happen with dad with the man? Oh, he thought wasn't yeah. he in another team and he hit. No, no. What, what uh, he, no, he was he was in he was in Philadelphia. <laughs> they were playing in Veterans Stadium and he hit a home run when Armstrong stepped on the moon and and everyone in Philly gave a standing ovation. He came to the dugout. The first time I got a standing ovation at Oway Park. <laughs> and then Becker said, look at the scoreboard, man. Come on. So, yeah, that that was funny. That's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, so yeah. that was a good so, story. There, right. Yeah. But I was there. But no. And then, obviously, it was a sad time, right, because we know how that yeah. season ended. But I'd like yep. to say I was a silver lining at the end of the year. Oh, no. You, you were the sunlight from the apocalypse. There's no doubt when you were born that year. I think, you. you know, come December, dad's still having a hangover from it, from it. You know, you know, he is. And then you're born and he just, it changed things. And I, I remember I got pushed to the middle. <laughs> and, yeah, and, you, did. you had that middle you child came, but, syndrome. No, I apologize. But, but that was, that was, <laughs> that was <laughs> though, it did, it did help. It did help the family. There's no doubt about it. And then you even look at, you know, uh, the course after that, um, you know, uh, you have you have two great sons and it's just that yeah. connection that you kept us all because it'd be a different thing if it's just me and Ronnie. You know, we don't have any kids and, you know, it's a different. And, and so, yeah, you you I really believe that the birth of you in 69 kept <laughs> more of us together. And, you know, to, to, to even today now, we're all so close, you know, and that's just yeah. beautiful. So. I'm you glad, know, Jeff. Um, I'm glad you appreciate the birth of me. And that was, see that. <laughs> you know, I got to say, though. You, to our family you know, dynamic. You, I'm glad that you've, it, it brought it, us all together. <laughs> you got to go down deep. You know, especially like you said, after after dad passed, you, you know, you definitely go into the cycle of a lot of things and you go, God, oh, man, there's such a, such an evolving story throughout. And 69 was a, was a big moment for our family. Uh, you, any, any way you look yeah. at it. I mean, mom talked about that, you know, it was devastating at the end. And you don't know what that what that lingering effect does to a family, but and it hurt dad. But obviously, we're we're always moving forward, and and that's how it goes. That's life. But right. there is, I mean, you definitely were. You know, mom was in New York during the Don Young game too, so you were there right there too. I, I just I just wonder like what the effects. I know you get you were a Spitfire as a kid. There's no doubt about it. Oh. I remember like the energy you had. So you know, you never know what you know. And and then you have a lot of dad's parts in some of the. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say we both do. Yes. Yeah, we both do. We both do. The hypochondriac part, though, maybe a little bit more. Oh, be early years of you. I'm just talking. Not anymore. You know. It, it's, yeah. you know no. No. Different story. Well, we we know that. So, but different call. But I think. Yeah. 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 But I but I do think though that you know yeah you were just like this energy where you know I remember at three you're on a diving board you know jumping off into mm-hmm. the lake I'm like doing somersaults. I mean, we, you just had that, that energy, you know, and you never know. I, I'd like to ask the, the psychologist what that means, you know, that roller coaster ride you took as a kid inside my Did I, do, we, do you want to talk to a psychologist about me? No, no. I'm just, as a joke, I'm, I'm just yeah. kidding. I just wonder what that means. I know, you know, how people look at something like that. That was, just, I mean, you know, there's a lot going on when she was pregnant with you. But anyway. No, 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 no. I see what you're saying. Yes, yes. I, 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 okay, I'm, I'm, I'm catching on. And you know, like that whole life then, and yes, I was, I mean, a little daredevil. Like I rode those snowmobiles, like I was racing yeah. them, I think at the age of like eight. And um, <laughs> dad would take us out there and put my friends with the back of an inner tube and he'd whip us around. And, right. and then I was racing like, you know, um, was a family with two guys down uh, around the lake. Oh, the I would race them. Ammons? Um and uh close. Next one. Um wow. oh my gosh. Anyway, I would race them. Anyway, there's a lot of yeah. 
I know there's a lot. Yes, and I would race them with my Articat. The dad let me drive the Articat. It's, it's, it's like eight years old. It's crazy. So, oh, um, you know, but I didn't ever, like, again, I saw dad go to work, right? Dad was, um, it was a different life, you know? It was, yep. you know, I saw him have to, you know, go earn a living outside of baseball until the yep. broadcasting came. You know, right. so that's where once I was able to, and I, you know, you could see a change in him when the broadcasting yep. came. You know, he just became um, more at ease. Um, you could tell how just happy and the joy that came back in his life yeah. for doing that. No like doubt. that just no was um, every day getting to that booth was so important to him. You know. Yeah, it was a light. It was a light for him. There's no doubt about it. Um, because yeah. there were some. There was a little darkness after the playing days went away, you know, figuring it out. And I just think, you know, hey. Well, the, the Hall of Fame, th- like the regular, yeah. uh, what's it called, the sports writer version, you know. And yep, and then yep. there was just kind of that looming. Like he ended, you know, with kind of, you know, you had that 69 peak and that disappointment. And then on to like the White Sox. And it just felt like, you know, all of a sudden this broadcasting career, yes, reignited him, I think. Yeah. Um, and then you he... You know, he cherished the fans and he just loved the game. And I think it brought back really who he was in the booth of what kind of player he was. And then he had all the JDRF that he was able to talk about, you know, in the booth again because his name became more top of mind and now the platform was bigger and he was able to do so much more with that cause. And it just all of a sudden was like, oh, yeah, this is the guy that had passion, heart, and grit when he played. Like, it just brought it all together. Yeah, totally. That we're listening to the booth. Yeah, and you got to see the personal side of him that people didn't know, that he's actually fun. And, you know, we always laugh with that, right? You know, it's just to see that side that he can make fun of himself and all that from the serious yeah. ball player. That was that was a great perspective for a lot of people that knew him playing and then, and then you know, heard him in the booth. So, yeah, it was, yeah. It was magic for him. And, it, and it, it really kept his life going that, you know, all the problems he had with diabetes that, that really – kept him moving forward yeah no doubt Well, people would say like even when um you know i went to school in texas at tcu and he really had just started as a broadcaster then um he was like turning that was when it was starting and stuff and he'd come down and visit but he um people were starting to recognize knew him down in texas i remember being in texas i'm like i know who my dad is like i just thought it was like a chicago thing again i wasn't right. around during the playing days but they, right. I mean, the high respect he had in the state of texas um you know, goes to show what true baseball fans, you know, but, you know, the best thing about him was, you know, being able to laugh at himself, but people would say, I love listening to your dad because I feel like I'm like sitting in a bar having a beer with him. Like he's that right. guy talking. Baseball. Exactly. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, I'm going to end it off here with talking about uh, the two grandsons, your sons, my two nephews, awesome young men, <laughs> both ball players. Yeah. Sam graduated from college and is in the professional working world now, living on his own, doing great. And Spence is a senior in high school on the varsity baseball team at Horizon. What's their baseball journey been like for you? Let's just talk about that. Oh, for you as a single here. mom raising them, you're on your own. You know, you're, you're really handing all the athletics. And, you know, me and Ronnie are kind of in the background to, to help them. <laughs> from a distance, but, but you're right in the middle of it. I mean, that baseball journey, we love baseball, but it gets a little difficult, you know, carrying that legacy. Yes. I'd say um, both of them obviously love the game and um, it was kind of like they were born obviously into it and, but they were, they, they loved it. They truly loved it and chose it on their own. I mean, I don't know, looking back, did they choose it? Like it was just so part of us and the natural right. path, but Sam, especially because dad was really, you know, so close to Sam, you know, his first 11 yep. years and he was right next door to us. And he really um, was out there like, you know, hitting off the tee with grandpa and, you know, Spencer came later and unfortunately was only six when, you know, uh, dad passed, but has some memories, you know, and, you know, so, you know, it was, I think important to them. They wanted to play this game. And um, and it had its challenges. I think you would know as well um, mm-hmm. growing up as a son of it. But even as grandsons, you know, even though they had a different last name, you know, Brown, um, there was always that kind of feeling of, you know, um, 
where they came from and their roots and they're well aware of it. Although for so long they were like, you know, he's just grandpa. I think when Sam was older, like we started going to Wrigley with dad and he would just all of a sudden it hit him. He's like, because just signing autographs and looking at the magnitude of who he was like, Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Spencer, obviously, as he grew older, he, um, you know, everything that we celebrated with the hall of fame and then going to Wrigley, he's throwing out the first pitch a few times and really then, you know, seeing the legend of grandpa, his flag out there, the statues. Um, so yeah, I see go into this game playing it yourself and I'm sure there's that feeling that weight. Um, and it's super competitive, you know, it's a different game. It's a different game for youth, um, right now, because there's just not just the pressure of like, okay, you had a grandfather that played this, you know, as one of the best, but it's an all year round sports. Now, uh, you, you have most, almost have to play it all year round yep. to compete. You know, yep. we're in Arizona. It's a competitive state for this game and it starts getting super serious at like 10, 11, 12. Right. And, right. you right. know, um, I mean, you have uh, club teams that have are new to this game, you know, before I think when we we're growing up, you know, well, especially us, it was just the seasonal sports. You played other sports yep. with it. But yep. now it's like, no, you have to commit early if you want to compete. And, you know, and now you're also paying to play with certain teams. And then as you get into high school, um, you know, we're at a super competitive high school that um, has a reputation of winning and upholding to that. So, you know, I have mad respect that both of them went through it. It wasn't as, uh, you know, the journey on the on the skill side wasn't as, um, obviously, you know, to the level of, of grandpa. But, um, you know, and you're seeing this and you're like in the thick of it as far as the, uh, yeah, you, know, you know, yeah. pressure. But yes, well said. They, uh, yeah, go ahead. But I remember, you know, luckily, Dad, especially even with Sam, and then I reinstated this with Spencer, is that he would say, you know, they also have the true perspective of, like, there's a lot of parents out here who believe in, you know, all we're investing in at this club team and these the, the top-of-the-line bats is, you know, their kid, they're holding out that the payout's going to be, my kid's going to be like Mike Trout, you know? Right. And right. You know, so you're in that kind of like, it's surreal. I know if dad were here, he'd be like, this is unbelievable. The level of uh, expectations on these boys. But he did say, you know, before he passed to Sam, like, you have to, you know, don't feel you have to play this game because of me. And, um, I'm, and I'm sorry because I made it look easy, but it's not. It's not. Right. It's so, not an easy so. game. And, He's an anomaly. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about yeah, it. Yeah, and he was. He, yeah. he admitted he had a gift, you know, and well, that this was, you know, but he did say, whatever, all I care about is whatever you do, you do because you love it. If you love the game, play the game. If you love something else, do that. Long as you have passion and love for what you do. So right. I see my boys and they've been, I mean, again, you know, for them to even play all through high school at a team like this, you know, is a success. But what I see in them is the level of character, their fight over adversity. And, um, you know, I look at them and I'm like, okay, well, you know, they may not be going on to play D1 and, and from there on, but that wasn't their journey, you know. But what they did have that dad instilled was um, their passion, their love. No doubt. Um, yeah. And their good character. And, and they were always humble. Yeah. And they were humble. Yeah, they're yeah. humble. They never... You know, some of these kids didn't even know their roots, you know, till later, these, you know, their teammates. Right. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And I think, you know, um, and we'll end it on this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, now they understand the game and they love the game. And, and there's so many things. There's other, you know, if they want to stay, if Spence wants to stay in baseball, baseball, there's other things he can do. I mean, you know, he's he's so intelligent and both your boys are just so well-rounded. And you got to look at it this way. And I, I, me and Ronnie have looked at it, too, like. It's dad was an anomaly. He came from a different time, a different culture. Now the culture in baseball is play on these teams. It's almost kind of like forced on you. The culture that dad lived in was actually enjoying the game. You know, the baseball stadium, minor league stadium, right down the block from him that he worked at since he was nine. It was just, and then he still played the other sports. So, and he still lived an inner city life that, you know, it's, it's, I got to live, you know, this is the situation I'm in. It's, and it wasn't much, any 
really much money. So dad's fight was a lot harder. Like, it's like, I'm going to fight for this where me and Ronnie had a, a bit of a nicer life. You know, you two, you know, we all had a bit of, and then even now the gender, this gender, it's, 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 it's different. And, no. and you're going yeah. into something being forced to like play it thinking some of the parents thinking their people, their kids are going to be, you know, Mike Trout's like you said, but at the end of the day, and even Pat Hughes said this, you know, he's going to the hall of fame to do it. It's, 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 it's so hard. And, and what Pat as a broadcaster too, it's so difficult that the odds of getting there, I mean, they're, they're it's it's not easy, and so I feel like um, your boys understand that now, and they had experienced it, and it's going to be good for them in so many ways because I believe baseball is a metaphor on life, you know, and you learn all oh, these essential things no to be patient and all the things of failure and well, all those things work. So so you know, and the brotherhood of teammates, you know, the brotherhood of teammates, and um, yeah. and yeah, I mean, I think. They're obviously going to be stronger because of it, you know, but they did. They went in with a realistic perspective, you know. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, even Spencer had dreams of kind of an MLB star when he was younger. But as he grew up and got stronger and, you know, was playing the game, I mean, he he, he knew. He knew because he's been around it and he's been around us. And we've all, all had that perspective. Not that, look, I always gave him the hope. Like, hey, you want this? By all means, you know go for it. But there was also, you know, a true perspective that, you know, you got to have a backup plan and it's not all things, but maybe it plays a different role in your life and maybe it's well, not that's a different. Yeah. Well, that's the difference. The, the dad had, didn't have a backup plan and that's the difference. You know, these, these no. kids, most of these kids have backup plans now that their parents are throwing all the dough at them, but uh, dad never had a backup plan. Pat Hughes never had a backup plan. You know, Joe Montana didn't have, you know, the people that I've talked to, it's just the same thing. You look at those kind of, there are there is no backup plan, and, and that's the difference. And but well said, no, Linda. No, but they um, they are more uh, manufactured today. Like there's like the yeah. these kids are manufactured yeah. by just the parents. They right. like get out every day. Yeah, and, yeah the push, but yeah. it's a lot of pressure too. But yeah, so and they're not as no, well rounded as guys like Dad as far as culture goes because they're just pushed into this one bubble. And you no, know, and they burn to, out. To, they to, burn out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They burn so. out very fast too. But yeah. no, but it's still look. You know, we still love it, and we're and so, you know, he's celebrating. They're going oh, to playoffs right. here, and he's exactly. a part of that. And to be able to even have a strong high school career at a place like this in Arizona is, you know, um, yeah, he's winning. So, yeah. Dad yeah. would be no proud. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Of both of All them. All right, Linda. Well, thank you for being my third Cracker Jack. Um, it was nice talking to you about all this and, you know, you've done a great, great job with, with your boys and, um, really proud of you, Linda, you know, oh, they're, they're great. Me me cry. Yeah. You know, I have a quick memory, dad, um, you know, Sammy's birthday is on Thursday and, um, oh. and dad, uh, when I had Sammy, I was in the hospital and dad was in Miami with the team. Um, so it was 1999, obviously April 27th. And, um, and I, he was on the phone just waiting until we got back to the room. You know, um, I think mom was talking to him, just kind of giving the play by play on Sam and we had him and I got back to the room and he was on the phone and he was, you just hear the roars and everyone cheering. I have a grandson. I have a grandson. (laughs) And, um, you know, he ended up for the first time he hadn't in like 10 years as a broadcaster, he took the day off and flew out just to see Sammy and meet him, which I was just thinking of that memory when you called. Oh, wow. I know, which he's never done. I mean, he later missed some games because of health reasons, but you know, he came out to hold him. Yeah. That's that's awesome. You know, yeah. It was super special. Yeah. Yeah, Cause when we were kids, uh, well, you know, when I, when I was born, yeah, the, he's not showing up to the hospital. He's playing. You know, I mean, it's a different thing. Like that's almost well, like the grandfather becomes a different, <laughs> a, a different kind of role model. You know. Yeah. Sorry. Didn't mean to. Yeah. Rub that in. No. But no it's great. Um, I'm just making a comparison yeah. back then. That's how it was. True. You know. It's just. But it it's is, beautiful. No. And you, yeah. Yeah. Grandparents. You yeah. know, it's different as a grandparent, right? It's always different. Yeah. It didn't affect me. I'd be like, Dad, what the hell? Are you come to see me born? Get on the field. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, no, but that's awesome, was, Linda. Uh, yes. Yeah, great story. Well, well thank great you. Story. I appreciate being a part of you, this, Jeff. Sounds yeah, great. it's awesome. Thanks, thanks for being on. All right, I'll talk to you later. All okay. Right. All right. Talk to you All later. Right. Have a good day, Linda. See you. Bye. That's it for episode three. If any of you know who that middle relief pitcher my sister was talking about, he eats licorice. 
has dark hair, carries a headshot of himself, hops over the foul line before he goes to the mound. I think he played in the early 90s or middle 90s. If you got the answer, write us at jeff.pppodcast at gmail.com. And as many of you know, doing a podcast takes a lot of time, effort, and resources. So if you enjoy listening and would like to support us, I invite you to visit our Patreon page. There you can get exclusive content, early access, and other perks. Click the follow button for next week's episode, part two of Pat Hughes' interview. It's awesome. Thanks for listening and for all the great support. Until next time, don't let the ball play you. Toodaloo. This moment was brought to you by Sanofilms.com. The place to buy this old cub DVDs, posters, and some real cool t-shirts. So, that's sanofilms.com. Check it out. <laughs>